All right, hello everyone. I hope you can hear me just fine. Let me know if you can't. Um, so this is a plan, unplanned stream. In fact, the header of the stream probably says like June designer chat. Don't worry, we'll fix that later. Uh, so this is a stream that I, we wanted to do be, to celebrate the release of the campaign mode uh, to testers. Um, and I am going to try to restrain myself from talking too much about the design. Uh, both because there are other things I'm going to be working on today, and also because this is primarily going to be a, a teaching document. So first, uh, some disclaimers here. Um, this game isn't done. We're still working on it. Um, some of the art you see here is very close to final. Other, ha other parts of the art have not, has not even been touched by a graphic designer. Uh, but it will get there all eventually, of course. Um, so let's get right into it. Okay, so what you're looking at is a lightly set up board from the campaign game. And the campaign game of ARCs, I just want to stress, um, you should definitely play the solo version of the game, for, or not the solo version, the uh, single session version of the game first. It's a lot easier to manage and play. Uh, and it's a good place for starting off. Eventually, we'd actually like to have ways for that single session game to hook directly into a campaign so that if you play the single session game, you're essentially doing a preview. Like you're essentially doing, a, sorry, not pre a prequel to the game. So the winner's position becomes the position of the Imperial ships. Um, okay, uh, yes, one other thing is spoilers. Uh, some people are going to want to explore this campaign like a scripted story. Uh, I'm going to probably be spoiling all sorts of things in this stream. So if you are especially sensitive to narrative spoilers, you can avoid this. All, uh, you know, skip the stream, wait for the game to come out. Uh, but... Uh, Arcs is not a game built around narrative spoilers, so please, even if you are normally sensitive to spoilers, feel free to, to hang around. Mo and I'll try to give little little tags. Um, okay. Um, all right, let's get right into the chat. Uh, so, and if you have questions, by all means, feel free to send, uh, send it all along to the chat, and I'll respond to it as soon as I can. All right, so what you're looking at here is the campaign game. The theme of the campaign game is a little bit different from the single session game. The single session game... Uh, happens during a period of feudal warlords. Uh, it's very aggressive, very fighty. Uh, the campaign game uh, imagines that one of those feudal warlords won. They founded this empire, which sort of flourished and then has been slowly crumbling as all of these uh, ancient problems, which have been lurking for a long time, are kind of coming back. So in, in the campaign game, critically, you'll note how we are all kind of intermingling with all these colors and these systems. Um, this is because we are all all starting on the same team. In the campaign game, every player begins as an Imperial Regent. We'll give them their little Imperial Regent uh, tiles here. Uh, there are two political statuses the game begins with, an Imperial Regent, these are called titles, and then an outlaw side. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then in the campaign game, uh, you're going to be dealt, uh, at the very start of the game, two fate cards. So here's the Partisan, here's the Founder. Uh, you're gonna choose which of these fates you want to pursue. And whichever you choose will go right on your player board, just like that. And that's who you're playing. Now, the idea is that uh, you are, you know, of, of reasonably well-positioned birth, although not always. And you've recently come back from a grand tour. Or your primary education is done. And you have a sense of what you'd like to do in the world. You're a member of this, uh, of this ruling class managing the empire. And now you've arrived home from your grand tour and you're going to decide what sort of world you want to help sculpt. Uh, the campaign game has a lot more cooperative play and it doesn't always turn into a big bloodbath, although, although it can. Um, okay, so uh, you've got these, these uh, plotline cards. Now the plotline cards you'll see have a path to power. This is basically how you're going to win the game. Uh, the campaign game is won by power. Your power is cumulative from all three games. Um, and at the end of the first and second game, it will be uh, eroded. It takes a, a, big, a big kind of death tax, essentially. And then you go into the next game building on that, that power that you've built. Your player position is uh, pretty persistent. So whatever you have on the board at the end of one game will carry directly into the next game. Now, previously, we had, this inter we had an intermission phase that involved a lot of like power spending and buying. What's happened in development is as we've sped up the pace of the game and we folded things like the events and crisis systems into the design itself, we haven't needed to have a really uh, big expressive intermission because the core design is already doing that work. And of course, the intermission might change. All this stuff might change. Um, okay, uh, last thing I'll say before I start getting into the rules, I'm not going to teach you how to play core arcs. Um, 
we'll probably do a better base teach a little later on. Um, so this is really just for folks who already kind of know how the game uh, works. Uh, okay, cool. So uh, when you're playing the campaign, you are playing with a few elements. Uh, one of the things you're playing with are these plot line boxes. Another thing you're playing with are these event cards right here. Here are the three event cards, uh, which we'll use these dice. Um, the, and then the last thing that you're playing with are these uh, kind of global effects, um, which relate to the event card. So all this stuff is kind of like bound, bound together. So in terms of the number of systems it's adding into the game, it's not a lot. And the base rules of the campaign are basically two sections. It says, hey, you've got plot lines. Hey, you've got events. And the events tie into all the other global rules. What happens, though, is as you play the game, you will unlock new systems that will dramatically change uh, how the rest of the game works. The only other component uh, that gets added are these, these blight pieces, these special counters. You'll see that there's a lot of special punch board in the game, including these little cute blight. Um, the main thing you need to know about the counters is uh, they, if, they're, if they have this shape, they only go in the special slot. And then those icons have effects. So the hazard icon, which is in the bottom left, means that whenever a hazard is rolled, everyone's going to take damage based on the number. The shield means that it's uh, fortified or protected, which basically means uh, this takes two hits to damage instead of one. Uh, Blight has a damage side, which is indicated by the, the dark background, and an undamaged side, which is indicated like this. Okay. Um, there's other stuff in the campaign that we'll be talking about a little bit later, but just know that this is kind of the, the base entry. All right, let's start by talking about how plot lines work. So the way plot lines work is uh, you're going to have essentially like a card library. And so I'm going to take, uh, we'll use the founder as an example here. The founder says, uh, your path to power says, hey, object in Act 1, you need to control a system in three sectors without being in the Empire. Cool. So outlaw country is the path of the founder. Uh, if you fail that condition, you, it costs you power. All right. Act 2, have seven free cities on the map. We'll talk about free cities in a little bit. And then Act 3 is be leader of the Confederation and have more free cities controlled by the Confederation, mem by Confederation members than not. Now, that little, um, I'm, I'm pointing at my, my screens if you can see me, uh, that little plus card icon just means, hey, uh, leader of the Confederation is a term that doesn't mean anything to you now. It will mean something later. Hold your horses. In the top right, you'll see that your fate lies in box two. So let's go grab box two. So box two, and we're not, you know, we say box two now. We don't really know for sure how the storage solution is going to work. So all of the cards associated with the founder are in this stack. All right. <clears throat> so the first thing you're going to do is start flipping cards when we do setup. Uh, oh, and I should say I'm not going to talk about setup that much except to say uh, there's going to be a lot of blight that's going to start on the board. And then two of the sectors, one second, let me put some more blight out. Uh, two of the sectors sequentially are going to start with Imperial ships, and then the players will deploy within the sectors with Imperial ships. So this is the, like the known world, and this is the scary world. Now, there's one other element to set up, which I haven't done, um, which is the free cities. So, uh, oh my gosh, this is such a scattered explanation. So at the start, because I wasn't planning on doing setup at all, but I do want to talk about it. So when you do setup, you will roll this shape die to spawn the free cities. So they're going to be on the hexagon systems, so we need one, two, three, four neutral cities. And they are going to sit on the hexagons. So hexagon here, hexagon here. And uh, by the way, these IDs are, you can see, every um, sector. This is sector one in arcs. And it has a crescent, a hexagon, and an, Evron, uh, and an arrow. I just combined arrow and chevron. An arrow spot. Um, and so we know this is one hexagon is this, is this free city. Now, these free cities don't start with blight, which is nice for them. Um, they don't start with blight. Uh, and a free city is basically uh, controlled by whoever uh, has the most ships in it. So it's like a lost city far away. It can be used by players. If you destroy it, it'll generate outrage like anything else. It doesn't belong to any player, though. <clears throat> okay, so let's take a look at the plotline boxes. So sorry about that setup detour. Uh, plotline box. So the way this works, uh, and, and this is a lot easier physically than it is in TTS. It's just TTS is a little fiddly about this stuff. Um, you will start revealing cards from the top of the box. So this says, setup, gain parade fleets. And if you keep flipping, 
you'll see that there are your parade fleets. And then you'll get to a card that says stop. When you get to a card that says stop, just put it on top of the deck, and then you can just kind of set your deck aside. Now, this objective card, you just... Sorry, you shouldn't be there. Go away, partisan. So the, you'll put your founder there, and then you can just put this objective card. Oh, and all this stuff is way out of scale. My gosh. Um, in the real game, it scales like this. <laughs> um, so you just put that founder card, right, I guess, I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make it look like it looks in when it's printed like that. So there we go. Um, so your kind of display is going to look like this. So you see as a founder, you've gained parade fleets. You start with this. And then you have an objective carving your way. Well, let's take a look at parade fleets. So scoring, if you're an outlaw and you get first place in ambition, you get extra power equal to how far your ambition value is from second place. So this is cool. This is, hey, if you're, if you're outlaw, you are going to get a lot of extra points as long as you declare it. But going outlaw early in the game, that can be a scary proposition. Uh, the little D tag in the top left by the title just means that this card can never go away. If it gets destroyed or whatever, you just put it on top of the market deck. Uh, and then let's take a look at our, at, at our objective. So the objective says you need to be an outlaw and control at least one system in three sectors. If you fail, you pay six power. If you're not an outlaw, plus three power for every missing sector. Uh, so that's our objective. We want to be an outlaw. We want to have a system in three sectors. You might ask yourself, how do we become an outlaw? I'll tell you later, uh, but it's coming. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on here. So on the stop card, this is like the resolution card. So at the end of the game, we're going to look at these objectives. And if you fail the objective, what happens? Parade fleets gets added to the court deck, which means it will be up in the game for other people. And then we scrap the remaining cards in this stack. So this whole stack of cards gets uh, yeeted right out of the game. And then bottom, if you complete your objective, add two political intrigue cards and the freedom found card to the court deck. Place two free cities on an empty planet on empty planet slots, each in a different sector. That's nice. And then you may advance your plot line if you do take the remaining stack of cards. Um, okay, so where are the political intrigue cards and the freedom found cards? Well, they're in the stack. There's political intrigue. Here's freedom found. And then this next card is, hey, if you continued on this plot line, you're gonna you're gonna do these steps. Okay. Now, at the end of the game, and I'm going to be skipping around here, we resolve the intermission steps, which are right here. The main thing that's going to happen is you're going to resolve your fate, and then you're going to choose your fate. And we're going to deal out, if you're playing with three players, say, three B plots. And in reverse power order, people are going to pick a B plot that they want, and that will replace the current plot that they're in. If they failed their plot, they have to pick a B plot. If they succeed in their plot, they have the option of doing it. This means that whoever got their butt kicked in the first game, maybe they want to side with the Blight and become the Blight Speaker. Maybe they're done with us and they want to become a pirate. Maybe they want to try to be a peacemaker. Whatever. And you repeat that after each game. Uh, now, you will you will have noticed that some of these cards get added to the court deck on this. Uh, the court deck in the campaign game is over here. And you'll note that the base game court deck is 31 cards. The campaign deck only has 17. Uh, one little change in setup. When you play the base game now, we start with a full set of lore cards to begin with. The campaign game works differently. Instead of the court starting uh, with all, all lore cards, we build a lore deck. One card for each player. So we're playing a three-player game. There's only three cards in this lore deck. And then the initial court starts with four cards dealt from this uh, campaign court market deck thing. We're still figuring out the, the terms for these things. Um, so, you know, if you succeed, Freedom Found, Political Intrigue, these cards are going to be mixed in with this little court deck. Um, and that's going to change the dynamic of the game. Uh, okay, and that's basically how you resolve these plot lines. Every single plot line changes how the game works in a fundamental way uh, at, the, at the A level. The B level plot lines change the game f fundamentally for how an individual player plays, um, but it also creates scoring opportunities for any player at the table. And the C plot lines include special scoring conditions, which we might talk about uh, when we're doing odds and ends at the end. Uh, okay, cool. So that's how uh, the individual plot line boxes work. Uh, you can see all the plot line boxes here. Some of them have art. Some of them will be getting art later. Um, okay. 
Uh, oh, you'll notice that some of the plot lines have like circle tokens, like here are these sleepy, go sleepy golems that you have to wake up. Uh, circle tokens generally can't be attacked. So if you see a circle token on the board, know that it has effects on the game, but it, it can't be attacked. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, that's all that stuff. Those are all the plot lines. That's the basic overview of how plot lines work. Now let's talk about events. Okay, so in the action deck, there are... Oh, sorry. Before we talk about events, we're going to talk about um, the global rules. So uh, the Game of Arcs we're hoping is going to come with a, a rigid player raid that will be six slotted on each side, so it can hold a total of 12 cards, although you won't often need all slots. And the idea is that as global rules get added, you just slot them into this player aid, which you can then pass around. So let's look at the global rules that are in play at the start of the campaign. Free buildings we've already talked about. There are free cities. Eventually, there will be some free star forts on the map. Anybody who rule who controls the spot, the place of the building, gets to use it. Um, you can raid them, and you spend, uh, you gain resources of the planet type, two keys each. Okay, that's what the free buildings do. Um, ooh, I'm realizing that we're short a card because the blight card is not out here. I will fix that in the va. That's not working. Bad. That's fine. I'll, I'll just remember. Um, there is another card here about how the blight works, so it's not out here for some reason. I'll figure that out and fix the mod. Uh, okay, let's take a look at uh, what it means to be an Imperial. Uh, the Imperials, which we all are at the start of the game, they have this thing called the Imperial Capital, which is sitting out here. That matters. It's, it, uh, it's in a random spot. So when you do setup, what you're going to do is roll these two dice, and this tells you, hey, the Imperial Capital is in one arrow. You're going to set up the Empire in, in, region, in sectors one and two. And so that, you know, you can kind of do all the setup and then you, you put Blight in the free cities in the other regions. Uh, the Imperial Capital can be stolen from, and we'll talk about uh, how, it, how it raids the Imperial Treasury in a little bit. Um, and then uh, what else about being an Imperial? Ah, the Watchful Truce, one of the most important part about being an Imperial. So um, on a Regent's turn, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll read the, the Imperial Laws. On a Regent's turn, you control all Empire-controlled ships uh, systems where they have any of their ships. So <clears throat> any place you have ships in the Empire ships, you control those systems. So for example, uh, yellow here controls this system, controls this system. There's an Imperial ship. It is in Imperial control as long as yellow is also there. Uh, then the, um, when a Regent's defending in battle, Imperial ships, they're going to help you defend. So they're good. You get, you get good. The Imperial ships are going to help you defend. But you are under the watchful truce. If there is an undamaged Imperial ship, you can't fight other regions and you can't tax other regions. If you do, you become an outlaw. So the game will let you like attack an Imperial ship or will let you attack an Imperial player, but it will immediately trigger uh, yourself into an outlaw. When you do that, the Imperial ship will side with the defender. So if blue comes in here and wants to attack yellow, they can, but the Imperial ship is now going to tilt over to the other side and is going to help defend yellow and blue will have to flip their, their thing to be an outlaw. Now, if an Imperial ship is damaged, or if it moves away, you can do whatever you want. Daddy's not looking. But if their sensors are on, you cannot fight each other in these, in these spots. Uh, and uh, when you're moving uh, and acting on your turn, you may move in battle with as many Imperial ships as you have ships. So for example, if it was like this, yellow wanted to move the ship here, they could take one Imperial ship with them, uh, if they had two ships here, they could take two Imperial ships. Okay. Uh, correct. Mods asleep, attack Imperialists. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Let's go here. All right, so that's all of the stuff for Watchful Truce, basically. Again, this isn't a comprehensive teach. It's just trying to paint the broad strokes. Now let's take a look at the event cards. So these three cards are shuffled in with the action cards. So they look quack like any other action card. There are a few exceptions. So let's look at the basic format. You can't play this card face down. So it's never used to copy, can't be used to seize as the face down card. It can be played face up though. Um, if this is the last card in your hand, you have to play it, okay? 
Uh, if you lead it, you immediately pass the initiative and take no actions. So basically, like, if I get down to only having an event card in my hand, which happens sometimes, I spend it, I resolve the event, I don't take any actions. Uh, no round happens, in, a, in essence. Now, whenever you play one of these, you take all of the actions of the lead card. So if someone led with, like, a two-pip aggression card and I play a summit, I get two pips of aggression. Doesn't matter which number's higher, whatever. The event cards always fully copy the lead card. Then you resolve the event. Events always have the same start, which is that you roll these black dice, and if one of them has a, it, 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 sorry, the black dice, there's a one through six on one, and on the right side, there's two of every symbol, and then half of the faces have starbursts. If you roll a starburst, you have to trigger all the crises, okay? So, what's a crisis? Well, hazards are crises. So wherever there is a blight on the board, it's going to do one damage to every player who is there. Okay? Um, that includes, I believe, neutral cities. I would have to double check that. I'm going to do it right now because I have these rules out. Um, Okay, yeah, so I'm just gonna, I'll read the hazard rules. So, um, so each hazard on the map deals damage to every player in the system as well as Imperial ships equal to the number shown. So it will not damage neutral cities, which is nice. They've, they've found out a way to get around it, I guess. Um, and you always, there's no choices here. You always damage on damaged ships, then kill your ships, then do cities, then kill the cities, then do starports, then kill the starports. So there's always, like you always are going to damage kind of like the next thing on the pecking order. Um, okay, so that's what we do first. Next, we look at crises in the market. You will see that this, uh, this Vox card that we have has um, a crisis symbol in the top center and a number. If we rolled a crisis and a five or higher on the other die, we resolve the hazard text. So these Vox cards, they don't just sit idle. If, if players ignore them, they will start messing with the game as the, the crises roll. Sometimes after you resolve the crisis, it gets discarded. Sometimes not. Um, okay, cool. So that is how the crises work. Now let's look at how the events work beyond that. So there are three types of event cards. The Edict card, the Summit card, and the Blight card. Let's start with the Summit card. The Summit card says there is now a Summit. A summit is a negotiation phase. So in arcs, generally, uh, players are welcome to talk and chatter throughout a game. Uh, they can make deals and wheel and whatever they want, but they can't transfer resources. There's no rules for it. They also can't make binding exchanges. There are no rules for it. Campaign arcs is different. In the summit, players can make deals. Well, let's look at the deals they can make. So these are the global summit actions that all players have access to. Let me make sure it's centered properly. Um, you can cede control. You can give away your, your pieces. If I want to swap my ships for your ships, that's a thing that we can deal. I can also swap my influence in the court with enemy influence uh, if, if they want. These are all deals that both parties have to agree to. That is the default for any summit action. Both parties have to agree. Uh, if I have pieces in someone's tyrant, if I'm holding pieces of another player in their tyrant box, I can give them back to that player. Um, yes, okay. Uh, I can also give resources or, fail, uh, or, or favor. So if I have resources, I can, I can give them to, to other players. You can also give favors. So what are favors? Well, these influence cubes, and by the way, for the true fans, uh, we're probably going to update these to be agents. So if you want to play with the cool meeples, they're in the model, the mod. They're just hiding over here. Um, so your influence cubes, um, you can give these to players as favors. When you give them to, to a player, it sits on their, their player card. Uh, influence cubes are their promises, basically. They let you take an action of another player on a f in a future summit. So you can never cash an influence cube out immediately. But the way this works is the player who called the summit, the player who played this card, let's say Blue did in this instance, if they have any favors belonging to other players, they can now cash them in. To cash them in, they, they return the cube to the player, and then they can take any summit action as if they were that player, basically forcing that player's consent. So if I have a bunch of yellows, so maybe yellow is like, I really need help with this thing, and they gave me a bunch of cubes. And then on a later turn, I get to declare a summit, and I say, hey, you gave me three favors, I'm going to go ahead and take three of your ships now. All right, so that's how the favor economy works. All right, that's the summit action. 
at the summit event. Let's talk about the edict. Here's the edict. Uh, the edict is going to be a row of cards. This will be a row on the table somewhere. Um, and you always resolve it in order. Now, we have no idea how many of these are going to be and how we're going to do the numbering, but basically there's going to be a number of steps. Now, the way this works is uh, at the start of the game, we only have two edict steps, but they're super important. One of them is the tribute. This is set at the start of each game. Right now, the tribute priority is growth. So starting with the player who called the edict, each player is going to give a tribute to the treasury. Um, every tribute has to be better than the last one. So you need to have more resources. Or if you have the same number of resources, the best tribute, the best resource in your tribute has to be better than the best re resource in the last tribute. So let's see how this works. <laughs> so basically, player one says, I'm going to, let me use these resources. Player one says, <laughs> I'm going to give a fuel. All right. Now, player two can't give a fuel, can't give a single resource because the fuel is the highest resource. But they could give, I don't know, let's say they give a weapon and another weapon. Now it's player three's turn. Player three could give three resources of any kind, or they could give two resources as long as one of them is better than a weapon. So if they gave like a weapon and a psionic, <coughs> the best resource in this one is greater than the best resource in this one, so they give it. All of these resources are placed on the treasury. Players do not have to give anything. And the way it works at the end of the tribute is correct, uh, correct, Jaden. Uh, they, they play a shooting game within the trick taking game. Um, the, uh, the way it works is the player who gave nothing or any players who gave nothing have to give one favor cube to the player who gave the best. So let's do that example again and say one player gave a weapon and a fuel. Then we go around the table. Player two says, no, I'll, I'm not going to give anything. Player three says, I'm not going to give anything, which means player two and player three, let's say they were yellow and blue, they're going to be giving each a favor to the player who, who, uh, who paid the most. <coughs> and that is the presentation of the tribute. Now let's go to the next edict step. This is the Imperial Treasury. The first regent, which is the player who gave the most, um, they can discard two resources. Oh, if nobody paid, uh, I can't remember what happens. Uh, but, but, but. I can't remember what happens. Great question. It's in the rules. I'm going to look right now. I believe if nobody pays, let me see. I can't remember. I just can't remember. Uh, it's probably in the rules somewhere. If not, leave a comment. I'll get to it. Um, actually, I don't know if you can leave comments in the file. I'll answer that later. Uh, it almost never happens. I don't think I've ever seen it happen because it's so usually it's cheap enough and you get favors from other players. But it is possible that no one pays um, and there's an answer somewhere. Uh, okay. So... What, what, do you do, what does the first region do with the Imperial Treasury? Uh, they can throw away two resources. They're always going to throw away from uh, lowest to highest priority. Okay. Um, and they do that and they can put one ship, Imperial ship on the map. It can go in the Imperial capital, a system with a ship or a system adjacent to one with a ship. Um, so this is, these resources get spent out to build ships. First region doesn't have to do that. If they want to build a second ship, they can, but it will cost three resources. Now, why might you not want to do this? Well, you might not want to do it because these resources exist on the Imperial capital and you can raid them from the treasury for two keys each. Um, also, uh, if do, 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 any outlaw who gives a tribute becomes a regent again, uh, but they don't qualify for the first regent race, so they can't immediately, immediately get, in the, get in the system. Uh, those are covered in more detail in the, the rules themselves. Okay, that system is kind of the most complicated part of the campaign game. And it, it, it's an interesting system because it, remi it reminds me about the John Company Law System, which is, it's a little complicated, maybe a little fiddly, but it does such weird and wonderful things to the game that it's survived kind of a while, and I would love to see it. We'll, we'll, we'll see if it makes it across the finish line. Uh, okay, that's the Edict event. Let's look at the last event, the Blight event down here. Uh, here's how Blight works. 
First thing, you repaired blight in the rolled sector. So we go to sector six, that's our rolled sector. So sector six is here. So we're gonna repair blight uh, at planets. So we go repair, repair. Now, if we had repaired no blight on planets, we would repair the blight on the gate. And there actually should be a blight on the gate here, and here, and here, and here. So if this blight event were to happen again, we would say, all right, let's repair blight at planets. Oh, look at that, they're both already repaired. So that will repair the blight uh, at the gate. Then we are gonna bloom. We're gonna place blight damaged at the rolled gate. If it already has blight, we're gonna put it damaged on empty spots on planets. So we then put blight here. If there's already a blight there, we put a damaged blight down here. Yeah, my, my inclination, uh, Elfo Zord, is that if no one pays, no one becomes the first regent, no ships get built, no favors get transferred. Um, that would be my, like, off-the-cuff ruling. <clears throat> uh, okay, cool. So that's, that's how the Blight works. Uh, so generally, they're going to be, like, slowly activating in sectors uh, throughout, throughout the board. All right, and that's the Blight event. Okay. Uh, why do I feel like I'm, like, not explaining a whole big section of the game's rules? But I've got, gone through almost everything. Um few odds and ends. Oh, okay. There's, there's one more, one more thing I want to talk about. Um, okay. So that is the overview of the campaign. I mean, really what we're talking about here are these new event cards, which get shuffled in the action deck. We're talking about these cards that sit here. There is another card that handles the blight stuff. I feel like it, it, it's, it's, it's gone in and out of the design at various points because of, uh, for reasons that we don't need to talk about. Um, if it's missing, I will go ahead and put it in the mod soon. Uh, we've talked about how the tribute and the edict works, and we know how the plot lines work. <coughs> There's one part of the design I haven't talked about, which is uh, the flagship mode. Um, the way the flagship mode works is various B plots, let's pick one, such as the Pathfinder. Let's say the founder has a bad game and they need to pick a new plot line and they decide to become the Pathfinder. Uh, the Pathfinder has a card at the start, before even their objective card. And this card says, do this immediately when you choose this plot line. Place a flagship board below your player board. And actually, it probably even shouldn't say below because we've actually reformatted these. Oh, I just threw all the stuff in the bag to sit right here. Here's the flagship. You can put it on either side. I realize I just grabbed the stack of all four of them. <coughs> okay. How does this work? The flagship, when you take the board, um, all of your buildings on the board, so first thing, um, place your flagship in any system where you have pieces. So the flagships are up here. So here's the blue flagship. Maybe I put it here. Then... Replace all your buildings with neutral buildings. I'm not going to bother doing that, but basically this would become a neutral starport. This would become a neutral city, etc. Those pieces are going to come back to your board. And then all of your starports are going to go in a row over here. Okay. And then uh, you get to put a spaceport token on the slipstream and on a hab slot. So we put one here, and then we put one here. So there's, we start with some equivalent uh, equipment. All right, <coughs> you don't build buildings normally now that you're in uh, flagship. Um, so do, 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 how does this work? Um, let's talk about the build action first. So the flagship, uh, firstly, is always, always counts for control. It's always one piece. It always stands up. It never gets tapped over. Uh, when you get hit, um, you... Uh, let's see here. D -d 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 -d. Uh, anything on your flagship board can be damaged. Okay. Uh, if a city that's on your flagship board is damaged, it can even be destroyed, in which case it will go back to your city row like that. Uh, starport boards never get destroyed. So if you, if you, if I damage like these starports, that's fine. They just never get, never get destroyed. Um, when you take the build action, you may 
build your Habs. You have two Habs. The Habs are like buildings that are wherever your flagship is. So if I have these two Habs right now, it's like I have a starport and a shipyard wherever my flagship is. So if I'm building, I'm building with my shipyard. If I'm taxing, I'm taxing with my city. Um, destroyed cities do in fact go on the Warlord box. Umbral, thank you, very good question. So any piece that gets removed from this board would go into a Warlord box as normal. Um, Okay, when I take the build action, I can build buildings into my slots like normal. You're just always welcome to build pieces there. I can also build ships uh, where I'd like. Um, when you build ships, you may put the ship in your spot or you may put it in a free hangar spot. That's fine, this is a totally fine thing to do. Hang uh, ships and hangars are protected. Um, let me actually see where the damage rules are. Um, yeah, uh, they can be damaged, etc., but they will move with your, with your flagship. Uh, at the start of your turn, your hangars can be emptied or you can have your ships, ships come into your hangar. So once per turn, once you may move your ships between your uh, empty shot slots in your hangars and also your flagship system. So that's what the hangars do. Uh, this is very useful because one of the upgrades you can get is the Slipstream Engine, which will give you a free move at the start of your turn. Uh, when you take the build action, you can also build ship systems. The cost of doing this is the resource listed on the building as well as the build action. Uh, you can always choose to place an undamaged starport or a city. When you place cities, they will open up hold spots. That's nice. Or Regency Points. That's also nice. But cities can be damaged and can be destroyed. Um, and when they are, you uh, get outrage, like anything else. Uh, starports won't give you extra hold spots or regency points, but they can't be damaged, which is nice. Um, okay, cool. So that, uh, and then you have all these systems on your ship. Uh, the force armor and plate armor are, have to be damaged first. Sorry, I don't even think that's written on here. But yeah, these have to be damaged first. Uh, tractor beam stops you from being raided, uh, and the weapons array uh, gives you two additional dice. So you roll three dice with your flagship instead of one. Slipstream engine, what, start of your turn, you get to move your flagship once. <coughs> the reason the, slip, uh, the flagship exists, by the way, is because the Pathfinder objective and any objective that uses the slipstream will have specific things that will point to where is your flagship. A lot of the plotline things are keyed to it. Uh, okay, so that's that's 35 minutes. That's a teach. Um, this hopefully will give you all the tools you need to get into your campaign. When the campaign is over, each match, you will go to this intermission sheet here on the left. It will tell you how to uh, prepare for your next game. I'm sure I made some small rules flubs. If you have questions, uh, the document that Josh prepared is the correct document. So go to, onto the Dropbox. This rule document has got every, all the information, hopefully, uh, you need to get your campaign in order. Um, oh, actually, there are two things that I forgot. Psych, we're not done. Um, let's talk about the last stage of every plot line. Oh, I can't believe I forgot this. It's so, so important. Um, so, yeah, I, I didn't tell people about grand ambitions in the last act. Sorry, I was winding things down. Let's say you make it to Founder 3. At the bottom, you'll note these grand ambitions. You're a counterweight to empire. So you have two grand ambitions. You're the confederation leader. We don't need to worry about how you become that. And you have more free cities are controlled by players in the confederation than not. Every turn, when we score ambitions, you will gain additional points based on the hand. So if it's hand one and you have one of your conditions, you will score one point. If you have both conditions, you'll score three. If it's hand four and you have one of your conditions, you get four points. If you have both of your conditions, you get 12 points. Got it. That's lovely, right? Grand ambitions, more ways of getting points. The B plot lines also have those, of course. The C plot lines do not. Let's look at the naturalist, for instance. The naturalist has what's called a countdown condition. So let me grab the naturalist. Here we go. The naturalist card. So when you get to the C plot lines, you'll note that they have another path to victory with this countdown nine. Um, <coughs> and it says, look, when you win first place in Ambition, count down for every system with Blight where you have an undamaged building. Okay? Well, now, what's a countdown? 
So various things are going to place your objective marker. Um, whenever you need to like track something for an objective, you use this objective marker and you generally like put it on a number. And then as you do something, you lower it. And then you get your objective when you got it to zero. The objective marker in the third act means something different. It's a lot scarier. Uh, the objective marker says, hey, put it at nine. You don't have any grand, amb oops, sorry. You don't have any grand ambitions. So you're, you're not, if you look at uh, the naturalist three card, for instance, uh, so this compared with that, uh, you, there are no grand ambitions on naturalist three, which means they're not scoring additional power in the last game. But when they win first place in ambition, they lower their objective marker for every system with blight where they have an undamaged building. So maybe I win first place in the tycoon objective and I have three undamaged buildings with the blight. Well, I lower this by three spots. If I can get this to zero, I win. It do, I don't care how much power you have. I got my countdown condition complete. All of the C plot lines have alternate kind of spoiler conditions built into them. Whew, okay, those are all the rules and I am late for my next meeting. So I hope this gives you the tools you need to play the campaign game. Um, I would like to be doing like actual gameplay streams. Maybe we'll play a game of short arcs. Maybe we'll do a two player campaign, stuff like that. All of that will be coming in the coming weeks. If you will be at UK Games Expo next week, I will be wandering around wearing a leader game shirt or a whirly gig shirt or maybe both at the same time. If you run into me, please come up and chat. I would love to uh, talk to you about games. Um, and I'm very excited to uh, visit Birmingham. So that's it. I hope you found this helpful and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Take care.